Nervous is not what I am. It's just annoying. A little ticked off, okay. Yes, it's because I don't do those. Um, it, it, it says, you know, funny stories that, that happen to you in your life, and I just... For some reason, I, it's like jokes. People say, tell a joke. I, I don't do jokes. I do endless stories. I craft things into stuff which I think are quite interesting. Um, <laughs> but I don't do real stories. I don't do jokes. When is a door not a door? When it's a jar. That's the only joke I know. Do you prefer the term comedian or stand-up comic? Uh, either of those. Okay. Uh, comic, stand-up comic, comedian, all of those kind of work. And when I first got to America, they said, you're not a stand-up, actually. They said, because um, stand-ups do uh, dick jokes and this joke and, hey, where are you from? <laughs> and your stuff is more all over the place and surreal and, and maybe intelligent to you slash stupid. Um, but I, in Britain, our, our comedians, because we haven't got a film industry, and so a lot of comedians stay being comedians. They don't get sucked up into a big deal. And if you do a television deal, it's not a huge money television deal. <laughs> so there's a hell of a lot of touring in Britain. And we have 60 to 80 clubs in London. It's the biggest club scene in the world. And you started off as a street performer. Yep, four and a half years of street performer. So that's why I can play Hollywood Bowl, because <laughs> I used to do all these gigs in this big opera pitch of uh, Covent Garden. If anyone's seen Mind Fair Lady, where Liza Doolittle is selling flowers in Covent Garden Market, that is where I performed, exactly there. It's got, it's got the whole scene is around these big columns of St. Paul's Church, and that's exactly where we used to hang out and perform in front of. So you don't so. do real stories, you don't do jokes. Yeah. You're a comedian. What, what do yeah. you do? Well, it's, you'll know. I mean, I, the, the, I talk about human sacrifice. That's what I start. <laughs> the force majeure that I am touring through. This is one slide, volume one of me playing all 50 states of America. And so, I read an article saying that you're going to do jokes in Russian, yeah. Arabic, and Chinese? Chinese will be after I go into politics. I'm doing an Al Franken in 2020, so I will be going, hopefully, for mayor of London or member of parliament in May 2020. And so after that, I, if I have time, I, I do Mandarin Chinese beforehand. I might be able to do that. I don't know, because they all say it's incredibly hard, but I don't need to write it. I just need to be able to speak. Is, is there a workout period where you're testing out, do these jokes work in no, Chinese? They, they, no, it's not that do the jokes. But all my jokes work in all languages, uh, all the developed languages. I don't, if I went to an African tribe or a South American tribe, I couldn't make that work because my references would be human sacrifice. Well, maybe they do human <laughs> sacrifice. Would be gods, do they exist? Uh, ancient uh, medieval kings in, in Britain, um, people smoking pipes. Squirrels yeah. with guns, and <laughs> and it, my references wouldn't necessarily match up. But I've already played Moscow, St. Petersburg, Istanbul, Berlin in German, uh, Hamburg in German, Vienna, uh, Zagreb, Belgrade. It all works. Johannesburg, South Africa, um, Los Angeles, Hollywood Bowl. I've played here in Chicago. I've played everywhere, and they all work. But not to Middle America, not to Middle Britain, not to Middle Russia, not to Middle Turkey. But I can play to the more cooler progressive, gotcha. have been students, will be students kind of people. They dig my stuff. Right before you go up on stage yeah. to perform in Chinese, you're telling me there's no sense of hesitation, no about nervousness. About whether it will work? Or about whether it will work. No, not wow. at all. Um, because um, it's, well, I mean, the first day, uh, no, like the first, I like Madrid. I, two weeks ago, I went to Madrid. Uh, and so the first night on stage, I did three minutes in Spanish. There was no hesitation that that would work because if I go human sacrifice, why did we do that? So all the people in, in Mandarin, China, uh, wherever I am in Shanghai, they'd go, yeah, human sacrifice, why did we do that? And I said, well, you, everyone used to do it. We can't even blame the Nazis for this. You can't because <laughs> they did other murder. They just did pure murder. Um, and... You know, all the intelligent people in Shanghai who are Mandarin Chinese speakers would go, yeah, well, I wonder why we did that. What's your examination of that, Eddie? <laughs> and then I examine it and I actually find it's, the, it's a fascist thing that because there's no logic to human sacrifice. If gods exist and they put people on earth, then, then taking one of these humans apart and offering it back up is just like sacrilege. It's actually sacrilege that human. Whoever got into doing that would must have been some right winger. So, what made you decide to go to a comedy club and test out the form of a stand-up comic instead of being a street performer? You mean? Yeah, because it was too rough being a street performer, <laughs> um, and it wasn't going anywhere. And you, you, we turn up anonymously. And um, I knew I wanted to play with words. Street is playing with vis. You have to do visual situation comedy, visual situation comedy, which is really odd. You have to sort of be getting onto a unicycle and have someone <laughs> helping you and doing. A huge stunt because attention spans change on the street. Um, adults become children and children become animals 
with their attention. So adults are just watching like kids. You know, kids won't really focus. So adults suddenly become like that. And the kids just won't look at anything because there's all this stuff going on. And you're trying to be more interesting than everything that's going on around you as opposed to in a theater where everyone's sitting there in the dark looking at you and they've totally focused on you. So um, I knew I had to move through that. But it was a great learning. I actually lost all the confidence in my body. I, I was a very cocky, confident person. I'd done three Edinburgh festivals, which is this big festival in Edinburgh, capital of Scotland. And everyone goes there um, in Europe to, to do their stuff. And I'd done three of these doing sketch comedy like Python. And I thought I was ready to go. And I thought street performing, maybe that's a way through. I'll learn to, how to do that in two weeks. And boom, it took me a year and a half to learn how to do street performing. It is so hard. It is just the Navy SEALs version of entertainment. You have to <laughs> wrangle the audience. And I started re- and my confidence drained out into a puddle on, on the floor. It just wasn't there. I was begging people, tell me, how do you do this thing? What, is, what are they doing? That Why can't I do this? Because I thought I could do stuff. But once I'd rebuilt it, it came back so strong. I know that Monty Python is a big influence on you. Yeah. In the family tree of stand-up comedy, though, what, what are the, the people that lead up to you? As well as Python? Who as well as Python. Me? But, I mean, uh, purely in terms of stand-up. It's Richard Pryor. Very much Richard Pryor for the character work that he did. The stories and the character work when he's going, hey, and he says, I had this dog, I had this dog. Oh, yeah, I talk says, about that one all the time. Yeah, That's my like, favorite. Oh, yeah. And he says to the bird, hey, come in here, man. Hey, get this stuff, get this stuff. Says, you shall not leave. <laughs> all that stuff when he would play with the mic. He, I saw one of, uh, where he said he was working in a club that was run by the mafia. I worked at a mafia club in Youngstown, Ohio. <laughs> and then there's this woman, she wasn't getting paid enough. And they wasn't going to pay us. I worked with a lady named Satin Down, a black, now I think Duke Ellington had written a tune about it. He went in with a gun and he says, you got to, I think yeah. it's a true story. You know how it is when you do something, you can feel there's something wrong. <laughs> and you got the gun. And when he would, what he'd do is he'd get the mic stand and mic stand would represent this very thin Richard Pryor. And he would, he would, he would put it in a headlock, the mic stand in a headlock. And that was him representing himself. And he would be playing the hood and going, look at Richie, come on with that guy. He's coming with a lot of balls on this guy. Come on, look at this guy. Hey, Tony. Wait a minute, come here. Do it again, Rich. Put the gun up. Hey, Tony, stick up. And... That was such beautiful work. So that totally influenced me. Steve Martin's stand-up, the surrealness of saying, uh, my cat's, uh, he's taking all the money. You think you know a cat for 10 years? He pulls something like this. And now while I was away, he would go out to the mailbox, pick up the checks, take them down to the bank and cash them, disguised as me. Spending all my checks, and I spent $220,000 on cat toys, and they're fantastic, and I love them. And, you know, Got the little rubber mouse, has a bell inside of it. <laughs> Boy, I hate it when it goes under the sofa. Whoa, give me that, give me that, give me that. So that silliness, the surrealness, Monty Python infusing everything. It's really what I do is Monty Python, the stand-up, Richard Pryor, and Billy Connolly, the Scottish comedian Billy Connolly, for his, uh, he would, he talks to vast groups of people as if he's just a guy in a pub and he's just chatting away. Well, I keep a very close watch on myself to see if I'm getting drippy willy syndrome. <laughs> and, uh, and I do, I do, I keep a fucking very close watch. And, and as you get older, things get very strange. You, you piss much longer. And, if you, and you, can, you drink a half pint, you piss a pint and a half. And he's like, and then there's another thing. And I remember this story, and, and he does, and I do stories, but I just don't do real stories. Uh, very I rarely. Actually, there's, you know, anyway, we're going to do a story <laughs> later. I try to find the story that is the real story. We'll be right back with more It's All True after this break. And when we return, you'll hear Eddie Izzard's headline for a funny true story. 